welcome everyone to the second webinar organized by MRO Business today. Our topic for discussion today is transforming MRO operations in the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. And we have with us Nicolas Tejera, who is the head of technical department at Falcon Aviation Services based in Abu Dhabi, UAE. We have Marius Barkas, who is the business development manager of engineering at Magnetic MRO based in Malaysia. And we have Liudas Jukons, he is the Director of Engineering at FL Techniques. A warm welcome to all of my speakers. Before we start with the webinar, I would like to add a few ground rules. Only the speakers will be visible and audible to all the registered participants at all times. The participants can post their questions in the Q&A tab which is given below. Please mention your name and your company name while you post the questions and also you can specify the name of the speaker to whom your question is addressed. We'll try and answer your questions during the course of the discussion. It is said that the year 2020 was the 11th consecutive year of global aviation growth. We all expected great things from aviation industry in this year. The Asian markets were on a roll with India poised to become the third largest aviation market in the world. We expected electric planes, hybrid engines and advanced drones. But then COVID-19 happened and everything came to a standstill. In times like these, the aerospace MRO industry is doing their bit to fight this global pandemic. Many MROs have expanded their facilities to manufacture the N95 masks. Some are printing the face shields for hospitals uh, while using the 3D printing technology. While some of them are, they are providing cabin modifications to carry medical supplies and patients. Based on this, my first question goes to Marius of Magnetic MRO on the temporary cabin modifications which is provided by Magnetic MRO. What is the inspiration exactly behind this idea and how helping to carry the medical cargo? Uh, hello everybody, first of all. So my name is Marius, I run engineering services at Magnetic MRO. So I hope all of you are well and safe at home. It will be a little bit weird to talk because I don't know how many viewers are currently currently um, uh, in, in this webinar. So yeah, so thank you for the question. So yeah, so first of all, how we come up with the idea. Uh, so we noticed that many of our customers started to operate planes with the empty passenger seats uh, just for the cargo deliveries, right? So what, did, what does it make sense, uh, economical sense, uh, even in this aviation hard times? So we come up with the idea to help them to utilize aircraft cabin space for medical cargo transportation and and our solution is, is quite for the low budgets what is already accepted for by by the number of the customers so so the the, the main the main advantage is that uh, by utilizing the cabin space for medical cargo we can help um, to add additional cargo capacity from 12 up, up to 50 five zero tons depending on aircraft types uh, by keeping the same flying costs uh, of the aircraft yeah so as we know that uh, these medical cargo boxes are really bulky and uh, it's cabin aircraft cabin we find out that the aircraft cabin is is great space to, to carry on these boxes so what we are providing, we are providing two options of the conversions. Uh, first options, option would be um, uh, transportation uh, of, of the cargo with the passenger seats on board. So we are simply putting boxes um, on the passenger seats. Uh, then the seats could be covered with some protection wrap or we can produce some special cover uh, to protect um, the expensive IFEs or expensive seats uh, yeah, and the second option would be zero packs uh, conversion, so without the seats. So then cargo simply is transported directly on the aircraft floor panels. So in addition, we are providing not just the modification packages, but we also have the solution for the installation kit, for the quite uh, cheap installation kit, I would say. So with this installation kit, you can attach uh, the cargo boxes uh, to the seat tracks. So, so yeah, so on, all in all, we can provide uh, the modification package for, and, and the installation kits as well. All right, just so that you asked how many participants are there, you don't know. Uh, I'll keep a count. We have about 100 and counting as of now. 
Alright. So uh, yeah, another question is, uh, what, how do you see the industry response to these cabin modification arrangements that you've done? Uh, yeah. So at the moment, uh, the there are quite high demand uh, for for the for for, for for these kind of modifications, and uh, currently due to COVID nineteen pandemic, um, as majority of the refurbishment or ret or retrofit programs are frozen for long term, or or even cancelled. And because airlines, you know, trying to 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 keep to start flying and keep or, and keep uh, and stabilize their operations, so yeah. So at the moment we are this this helps us a lot to also utilize our own manpower. All right. Any plans to make these modifications like permanent, a such in future, based on the demand maybe? Could you repeat the question because the line was not very clear. Uh, the, you say these modifications, the cabin modifications that those are done, they are temporary, right? As of now, they are done only for the COVID-19 pandemic. So any ah. plans uh, for these modifications to be permanent going ahead in the future? Uh, well, uh, the, the more accurate would be to call it not um, permanent modifications, but uh, which allows to carry any cargo because now, to, to, to get the fast approval so we can approve the modification and you can carry the, the COVID-19 operations related cargo. But as you said, temporary, so then it needs like a major change, STC, so we can provide that. We're already working on on few of these modifications for, for aircraft types, Airbus A320-21 and Boeing 737-NG, uh, 800 and 700. So yes, yeah, so also for these modifications, we already have open purchase orders and open projects. So with these, I would call major change STCs. Uh, once you confirm them, so then the customer can fly the, and then carry on any any cargo. It doesn't need to have carry this COVID-19 cargo. Yeah. All right. Perfect. Yeah. My next mm -hmm. question is to Nicolas. What, according to you, are the MROs currently doing? in order to combat this COVID-19 crisis? Like this is the most common question that everyone is asking these days. And what do you think should be their plan, not just to survive, but you know, to emerge more profitable in the days ahead to come? Well, thank you, General. Thank you, everyone, uh, to be there. Thank you for the invitation from the Maro Business today. Uh, very happy to be here with you sharing this, uh, this time. Uh, yeah, good question. What is well, what actions are being taken uh, from the MRO point of view is is, uh, is the first question. The the, the MROs, uh, as you know, is uh, unfortunately is, is one of these business that uh, first because they are strategically in most of the country. Even the lockdown that has been in many countries that has been operating, trying to be operating in as more normal as possible, uh, supporting the airlines and supporting the, the even with the reduction of the flight supporting the present operations in, on the different countries and uh, uh, the what the MRO has been done we, i think we should divide in two different subjects one is the from this uh, safety point of view i mean uh, unfortunately uh, not too many people can work from home when we are speaking about the MRO, maintenance cannot be done in your uh, living room. Uh, even uh, same for the pilots, or same for the uh, rest of the person they working in contact with the aircraft. So the safety measures uh, uh, that has been taken not only in, uh, in the Falcon Aviation MRO in general around the world, contacting with colleagues, uh, has been uh, very serious, very, very serious, uh, following the recommendation from the government and from the uh, sanitary regulatory authorities, but also following uh, what are the specific demands of the business that you are covering. Many of them are also still covering day-to-day uh, -day demands, not only on, uh, with the airlines, you know, even when the airlines are grounded, you have to still man uh, keep in maintenance on aircraft. You have to maintain other kind of operation, helicopter operation, special services. So it's, uh, it's not easy to keep the people safe when you are working in an environment that you have 40, 50 people. Uh, for sure, sanitation, for sure, separation of a ship, that this is uh, something that sometimes is difficult uh, to do, even with the regulation of the hand, no? with a proper handover, trying to avoid that uh, any kind of contact between ship, uh, in case that you have infection in one of the ship, at least you can continue operating and working. 
and uh, and uh, for sure all the preventive measures like masks, gloves, sometimes it's really difficult. How can you really separate people working in environments, in aircraft, in, in, in close environments? It's not easy. Other of the, of the, the second part of this is the final situation. As Marcus say, uh, really is, is a struggling situation for many people. And at, least, uh, at the end, depends on the business that the operator are giving. Operator are really starting to be a struggle with the business. They have no incomes, they have no cash. I received some, um, I received some uh, calls uh, demanding why the MROs are not using these opportunities to uh, advance maintenance, to uh, start to clean maintenance in advance uh, uh, in, in the prevention when the airlines or with the, the operators are starting to fly again. One of the problems is that the, if the airlines are not making money, they cannot pay in the MRO. This is one of the situations that, that you have to deal with. And I cannot forget, I don't want to forget uh, uh, something. In the last, uh, my last point, but not, not the less important point, is the human factor. On this. You know, the, the, the MRO, any company at the end is the people that work in the and the MRO at the end is based in the, the skills and the capabilities of the personnel on the, uh, on the, on the MRO. Uh, adding to the personal situation that everybody can have, I mean, and the worry about the, uh, about the families and about the, their own safety, uh, in many cases, because the lockdowns in airport, lockdowns in flights in and out, uh, people, especially people that is working away from his families are not visiting the families for many weeks now. So one important factor and one of the main jobs that managers, directors, we have to do now in the MRO is to be very vigilant of the morale of the people, of the, the, the human factor to train to maintain people on the street. It's uh, actually, I have to say, it's really amazing how the people is reacting around the world. Not only for sure in our business, but especially in our business with the high responsibility, with the higher pressure that normally people have. And due to the special circumstances, how people is reacting is, is really amazing. I am really, really, really very, very proud of the, the people, the, how the people are doing. Uh, that's true. It's, uh, the human factor is a very important factor in this entire pandemic. Now, my opening question to you, Das. I would like to ask, uh, according to you, what do you think? How huge is this COVID-19 impact on the overall MRO markets, like the global MRO markets? Yeah. Uh, listen, I, <laughs> I would like to have a, 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 the, the crystal ball here. Well, you know, perhaps uh, have somewhere a crystal ball. No. Uh, is, uh, you know, uh, I think was in your uh, website a few days back, I was reading the letter uh, from David Calhoun, the, the president of Boeing, to their employees. Uh, David Calhoun uh, say, I remember two very important things in this letter. First, uh, it was that uh, this expression that I think you use ahead of the news, that we are in uncharted uh, waters now. It's very difficult, really, to predict what is going to happen from now on in the industry. And it will be very important how long the situation is going to last. Because uh, there are many predictions, there are many scenarios that the people is, is uh, exposing, is expressing now. But if you really read in between lines, every scenario will be subject to how long the situation lasts. Because at the end, airlines is going to suffer, owner of is going to suffer, and MRO will have more, more or less business. The second important thing that, uh, that uh, they say on this letter to the employees is that they are trying to maintain the employees and the skills for when this situation finishes. Imagine if an OEM say that, how important is this for the MRO? MRO is depending, again, it's depending on the people, on the skill of the people, able to maintain uh, uh, the specific aircraft. Uh, 
if you overreact and if you lose these people during this outbreak, when the situation becomes too normal, if you have the possibility to recover this business, you will not have the people, you will not have the skills in your business to, to be able to recover yourself. Uh, All right. Um, yeah, I would like to pass this question over to Das as well. Yes. Swati, and, firstly, yeah, yeah, thank I, you very much. For I just want to thank you on such a short notice. Like, I can't thank you enough. Like I said, yeah, please continue. Yeah, so Swati, firstly, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, secondly, good morning, good day, good evening to everyone, uh, depending on where from the world you are. To answer your question, I think that the key points from my side would follow is uh, really uh, there are different opinions, as Francesco says, on how MROs will recover. But I would more like to focus on what are the critical factors for them to survive. And I think that the, the integration and the one-stop shop approach that MROs can uh, offer uh, globally is the key factor for them to survive. For example, when we look at ourselves, uh, when, when I look at the mirror at the, as the representative of FL Techniques, I, I think that the core strength of ours is uh, that we have presence here in Lithuania. We do have our presence uh, in uh, China, in Herbin, in Jakarta. Uh, there is an extensive reach of our global partners uh, across the world. Uh, not only to talk about the base maintenance, but also the line maintenance stations. We have more than 50 stations around the globe. Not to talk about the solutions that we can offer, not only base and line maintenance, but also full engineering support, uh, full design support, uh, trainings, so any logistical services, any services that the ear industry can even think about. So I think that Today, for whether you are an airline, whether you are a lessor, whether are you any other player in the market, it's what you can put on the table for them. And I think that this variety of solutions that you can put on the table is really the winning factor for us. So this is one, what you have inside, but also not to underestimate the network of partners. I fully agree with Francesco where he says that we have to focus on our people but I think the partners network and ability for you to consolidate the power that you have across the globe is also very important. And with all due respect, uh, what Mario said, uh, I, I really think that the design organizations are now looking at the cargo conversions and cargo nets and cargo bags. It's, it's very, very important. However, uh, you know, I think that the whole globe is now focusing on that. FL Techniques can offer not only bags, but nets, but any, any conversion that you would like from minor to major for the whole types that you would imagine. But this is not the only solution which is needed now in the market. And the more you can package it, the more complex you can go as we can, uh, the better you are positioned in the market now. All right, now we see that China is slowly restarting their economy and many MRO shops across the globe are, you know, likely to open in a couple of weeks from now. What do you think is the, will the Asia Pacific market see a broad recovery like in the coming few months or so? Uh, well, I can answer this question because yeah, I'm currently, currently based in Malaysia, in Asia Pacific. So we did quite many trials here. So yeah, in my opinion, uh, Asia Pacific will, will recover fastest in, in all the world because uh, for instance, Indonesia has more than 2,200 islands. So, you know, you need the aircraft to travel all around. Also people here choose to fly more than traveling using cars, bus, trains, like in Europe or US. Uh, yeah, so definitely based uh, according I, to the, yes. I read an article very recently which said that you know the markets in middle east will recover much faster than the rest of the world compared to asia pacific and again compared to the west it is said that the uh, middle eastern markets are going to be recovering very fast why do you think is that well so it's simple because well it's it's also true middle east because you can't travel by car from country to country you must fly also here in asia pacific also you will not travel to philippines or to indonesia or somewhere else by car or by train so geographically regions are separated by sea so you can try to travel by boat or by plane 
So both are the same like claims now. They are like downside. All the all the market are downsizing. So so you know people also tickets are really cheap in Indonesia. Flight tickets are much 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 more cheaper than in in, in Europe. Right. So there is no brainer that that it will pick up faster. And, you know I'm happy that also magnetic MRO is here. We are doing some total service here. So yeah. All right, my question is to Lucas now since, yeah, and Nicolas, please continue. You wanted to say something. No, no, I just, I just wanted to add uh, any small details. And this is that we cannot forget, uh, speaking about the Middle East, that especially there is uh, three cities, like this is Dubai, Abu Dhabi, and Doha, Qatar, that they are the more important hub worldwide. Uh, uh, so the, these cities are not, the aviation these cities are not surviving for the people in and out from the countries. Are, people passing by from east to west. So uh, all in the, between these three cities, we are speaking about 300 million passengers per year in normal conditions. So this uh, this has been reduced, I cannot say almost to zero, but in, uh, you know, in, uh, in uh, 18, 90% reduction during this outbreak. If the business is recovering, it's passing mandatory for recovering the, the worldwide uh, uh, traffic. I believe, and I uh, agree with Marius that the, the Southern Asia, the Asia Pacific, is a market that probably will start to move early uh, because, I think because the, the outbreak in China is already controlled, or it looks like it's already controlled, but also uh, because the mindset of the, of the people in this part, on this part of the world, but mandatory as soon the movement around the world is starting, it's, it's no way, I mean, they have has to move has to move back again. It's because also Middle East probably need to take uh, need to take the leadership on this. Uh, anyway, the governments in this part of the world, I think they are doing well in trying to control the, pan the pandemic. Uh, there is one thing that uh, I want to, uh, maybe I will be disrupting the, the, the general mindset, but uh, we are speaking when this is finished, but uh, I am not an, an expert in the, in the, I'm not a medical expert, but uh, he looks at the, uh, all the experts as the opinion that this is not just one wave and stop. There will be uh, several waves coming on this pandemic until, uh, until there is a cure or there is a vaccine. So maybe, and I'm living this now, maybe we have to think that some provisional measures can be established as permanent for the future. Ah, that's true. That's one part to look at it. Also, my next question is to you, Das. I read your article in the afternoon about independent MROs. So I want to know for, from you, you know, in brief, like uh, how badly will the independent MRO market be hit and how fast will they recover? Like, because in your article, you mentioned something which is totally out of the research, what is being observed everywhere. Everywhere I've read that independent MROs are going to be the worst hit sectors of the industry. So I would like to have your take on that. Yes, I, I, not to repeat myself too much. I think that, you know, we can divide the MROs into dependent and independent ones. And I would agree that the majority of the analysts would say that uh, the airline dependent MROs will recover faster. And unfortunately, I'm of the uh, contrary position because I do think that, yes, they are safer, but they are slower, they are not that agile, they are not that hungry to hunt in the market and to be proactive. And uh, I think that when you are an independent MRO, it is definitely harder for you to seek the safe heavens to get the job from your airline, but you have nothing to lose in the market, but to be aggressive, to offer the best solutions in the market that you have, to expand the network of your partners and to be there for your clients. Right? And as I said, uh, you know, you have to chase uh, to be global, uh, to be present and to offer the best solutions there. And I think that, you know, during the COVID, uh, the best thing about the COVID is that I've seen my organization inno innovating so much in all the business lines, whether this is DOA with uh, cargo conversions, cargo nets, cargo bags and all the solutions uh, to be readily available like this. But the same applies for the line maintenance, base maintenance, engineering, I would say, a reconstruction of the whole mindset. And I think that this agility of ours 
makes us and will make us the better and stronger organization globally. So what do you think? Uh, are there like, can we expect more joint ventures in days to come now? I do believe so, whether it's a joint venture, whether this is a partnership arrangements, and I see some of the questions in the, in the, you know, our chat box, that I do believe that being together, being stronger with our partners will be a necessity. It's, it, you know, we will not afford not to partner, right? And uh, those who will be more open-minded to find those solutions together will be on the winning edge. Right? And as I said, uh, this is not only what you as an organization have globally, you know, your daughter companies or whatever, but it's also about the relationship that you have with your stakeholders all, uh, all around the globe. Right? And as I mentioned, right, yes, we are present in China. Yes, we are present in Malaysia. Yes, we are present also across Europe. But to reach Americas, to reach uh, you know, South America, to reach Africa and all the regions where there is a capacity and where there is a need, uh, you have to really build the connections and we're truly, uh, truly present everywhere, not, if not directly, then through the reach of our partners. All right, Nicolas, you wanted to add to this? Yes, actually, uh, I mean, I, I am smiling because you just say actually two, two very important things. One is, one is the diversity, the, the capability of joining organization with different skills and capabilities and, and going to the market. Uh, one of the, of the things that we are really struggling now on the MRO, and believe me, will be one of the major problems and the recovery uh, will be the supply chain. Many chains are stopped for obvious reasons. Uh, MROs are spending now, and they will spend their own stock for in the first phases of the recovering, and I put recovering between brackets. Uh, but there will be a moment that probably the, the supply chain will be not up to the speed to supply the MROs and the activities on the aircraft when the aircraft start to fly. And don't forget something. Many OEMs are stopped the supply chain. Many airlines and many uh, owners of the aircraft, they will delay or stop the chains of the aircraft, all aircraft by new aircraft. Means that aircraft that they never supposed to enter in maintenance cycles will enter in maintenance cycles, uh, especially big heavy maintenance cycles in the future, in the next couple of years. So, the, for example, and I am living a new, uh, 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 maybe a business case for somebody open. I think uh, Ludas uh, is also very open to listen new business uh, cases, uh, Mario. Uh, a very, um, uh, maybe an important business case will be taking aircraft that they will be definitively grounded for, uh, for good and uh, take parts from this aircraft, recertifying these parts as part in the market. This is a possibility of business. I'm giving like an example. The second thing that Ludas say and this is very important, is the regulatory concept. The regulatory aspect is, is, is critical. I think the authorities, the regulatory authorities around the world, especially the biggest one, YASA, FAA, Transport Canada, Australia, they should think what is the new scenario that we are working in. Uh, we, uh, this morning I, I, I saw an email from a very good friend of mine, actually he, I think he's listening to the webinar, that he was uh, speaking about normalizing the abnormal. So we are in a phase that we are starting to normalize that this has not been normal so far. So this is, a, I think it's very important now to sit together authorities, operators, uh, MROs, all the uh, stakeholders on this business and think what is the newest scenario. And uh, joining hands with other MROs will allow myself that has some kind of capabilities like uh, uh, somebody has line maintenance capabilities in an aircraft to go to an authority in other part of the world and start to work immediately like this without passing for some cases the very long and very difficult uh, process that this is to get in some kind of approval. So uh, I, I have to reinforce actually every single word that uh, Liu does say. Thank you, Nicholas. Thank you for that. All right, I have a very interesting question coming in from the audience. Like when the when everything will normalize and when airlines will start functioning very normally, 
what are the expectations that airlines are going to have from mros um, in general so who would like to go marius please uh, in january like well so uh, january january is more of heavy maintenance season so we expect to definitely higher higher demand than than in upcoming like you know four five months so we expecting better better more orders for the maintenance as for the interior, I doubt that it will be many orders for the interior refurbishments, uh, because as I said, airlines would like to 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 keep flying and then li like to reduce costs as much as possible. But but for the maintenance, yes, for the maintenance, it, it will be better. And then if you are not making just uh, base maintenance, but you have wider portfolio of them of the of the um, capabilities. So it's even better. Up to that time, you know, you can um, consolidate that list. Uh, you can just uh, remove uh, departments which are not profitable and more focus on the profitable uh, services, right? So, so yeah, so January should be all right. Of course, I don't have magic ball to say, you know, when this COVID crisis will be over, but, but I, 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 I believe that in summer it should be, it should, uh, uh, airlines should, should start operation. And then as in Europe, uh, normally winter and, and autumn is like heavy maintenance season and like uh, five years before this crisis the demand was so high that it's not possible even to, to put in the slots everyone who is wanting to repair their efforts right of course it will not happen the same station but but I think for the independent uh, MROs uh, it, 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 it will be like uh, manageable really manageable. So you say MRO MROs in general are going to undergo a lot of change. Do you think this MRO industry is prepared to embrace this change going future, going ahead? And you know, there is a work for survival in this uh, in this time of uncertainties. Mm -hmm. So, what do you think? In short, what would or what should be exactly the strategy for survival for these MROs in today's testing times? Yeah, so just focus on the profitable departments, uh, just uh, to cut uh, the, the costs, uh, to, to definitely to cut the, to cut the cost, uh, to, to make better liquidity, uh, reduce some not maybe necessary subcontractors and better to, to, to use someone who, who, who really knows what, what, what they are doing. Yeah, and uh, I, I think in, 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 in next year, Farmer Rose will, will be definitely a better year. Yeah, I'll pass this to Nicholas. What do you think? Uh, what should will, be the strategy will, for survival? Yeah. I will be. I will be. I will be a little bit brave. I will do my. I will give you my prediction, my forecast for the for the next time. Uh, you know the, the uh, uh, you know that the maintenance is subject to two main to two main uh, aspects. One is for sure uh, associated to fly hours. In this moment, it's completely stopped. No fly hours, I have no flying. No maintenance associated to fly hours is running. Uh, but there is always a maintenance uh, associated calendar that cannot be avoided even if the aircraft is not flying. Uh, in other hands, many aircraft are in preservation, meaning that the aircraft has to continue having some maintenance. Uh, uh, if, as we expected, this situation is not lasting too long because in this case we will not only speak about uh, uh, survivals of the MRO, we will be speaking of survivals of the, of the war economy. Uh, uh, I really, I don't see a so bad a scenario, a scenario sorry, for the MROs are in some places is, uh, is, uh, has, has been appearing. Uh, there is actually for me and uh, some scenarios in what some even some airlines will have some difficulties to find a slot for some specific job and I, I told you I will be brave and I will give you my my own my own predicts my own forecast I, I I can predict that if this situation is not lasting for more than for more than one month for the next year, all the airlines that are flying narrow bodies, especially in those airlines that are entering on the cycle of the uh, C checks, uh, running the C10, for example, for for 77s, uh, 320 series, they will have serious difficulty to for finding MROs, a slot of MROs around the world. For example, in these cases, uh, our friends in 
in magnetic or even in Apple Technic, they will have a, a good point to say. So I don't predict a so bad situation for uh, for the independent MROs like, uh, like uh, other people say. The more important factor here, and in this case, many governments will have the work, their final work, will be how the airlines, how the operator will be able to pay this amount. Is the finance aspect how the, uh, the, uh, the airlines will have money, will have cash, will have finance uh, conditions to pay the MRO, uh, to pay the operation itself. But in terms of volume of job, I don't see so dark times that like other people can see. All right. Ludas, are you there? Because I cannot see you. I think your video is gone. Can you hear us? Yes, I'm with you. I'm with you, definitely. Um, I just wanted maybe to uh, share my opinion on the question here. Um, unfortunately, my camera is off, but I'm, I'm with you. I, All right. I, that I would uh, have a little contradiction to Marius here. Um, maybe not the contradiction, but the slight, uh, you know, other opinion. I would agree that, you know, cost saving is a very natural uh, focus there. Um, however, uh, this is a very, this would be a very short term approach. If you will look only on the um, cash generating and profitable uh, units of, of your organization, I think that you uh, you will be so shrinked during the, uh, the the whole crisis that your I think we lost him. Yeah, I think we lost him. Uh, let's wait for the ten seconds. With us, can you hear us? No, I think we'll get back to it when he's back. So I have another very interesting question. It's come from a Mr. Mohan Chandra. Uh, he's curious as to what will be the new opportunities or aircraft technologies that will be born because of COVID-19. Who would like to take well, this? Yeah, Nicholas, please. Well, I, I, can, <laughs> I can take it. There is, uh, well, you know, there has been, in the MRO, there has been uh, many, many, uh, programs that have been trying to develop in the last in the last uh, years. Uh, the two more important programs that I have seen around and some of the companies have been doing many advances is the use of drones for uh, external inspection. Even these mini drones or micro drones that are, are able, minor robots that are able to enter in engines. Uh, we are forgetting here something maybe. Uh, we are speaking on them at like uh, we are looking maybe only the line and base maintenance of the aircraft. But we cannot forget the line and base maintenance of the aircraft altogether is supposing only the, uh, around the 40% of the MRO business. 60% is uh, engines and, and components. Right? So it's a lot of technology. It's a lot of technology that has been developing in supporting these inspections uh, uh, that can, uh, for sure, can help to reduce uh, the shortage of manpower in the future. And I repeat the word shortage of manpower. Uh, all, uh, the market normally only remember MRO as the province comes. Uh, 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 everybody has speak about the shortage of pilots uh, for the future and how this is impossible for the, for the, uh, the schools to produce the number of pilots that will be necessary in the future. Really, uh, uh, where the industry should be really worried is on the shortage of uh, maintenance personnel. Really. There's no way, and everybody I think in the maintenance world has done some calculation, there's no way that the present schools called Part 147 in Europe or, or, uh, or uh, any other in, the, in around the world can supply the amount of manpower that will be required in MRO worldwide in the next year. There's no way. It is necessary to come to some kind of solution. For example, in our company, we have been working in agreement with Sony School and developing our own, our own uh, projects on this, uh, on this side. But believe me, this is a, a serious problem for the future. So any technology that can help to reduce the number of man hours working physically in the aircraft, it will be important. The second important development for the future has been in terms of data and terms of uh, uh, intelligent artificial, uh, artificial intelligence, sorry. So able to do a different prediction 
MSN G3 is there, everybody is implemented, but even that is, is, is necessary, a further step on this. Uh, people is, uh, especially on the engine side, they are being given the further step, and, and you can see now how many engines manufacturers are liaising, liaising with uh, uh, IT or uh, B2B company in order to be able to generate advanced information uh, that can produce a better predictive uh, data for the maintenance side. So th these two aspects that will be very important for, for, in, uh, for the future, especially when we try to, as Marius said, to reduce cost and to reduce the number of man hours applied to the maintenance of the aircraft. Again, some of these projects probably have been slowed down or even in some cases completely stopped because the final situation has been the first probably the first consequence of this crisis. I don't know in, uh, how long it will take to recover the normal speed, but probably uh, I think that will be the, uh, the investigation, the uh, research will be the first affected for this uh, situation. Less money for the market, normally is the consequence of this coming for, to the research. So it's not only in our business, it's in general, in, in any business. Uh, sure, please, Nuda, add to that. Hi. Welcome back, uh, yeah. Yes, uh, happy to be back. Uh, I think my, my um, uh, you know, ideas would be the following. You know, looking, for example, at the um, technical trainings, discussions that we have also, because I'm, I'm leading the part 147 school uh, here in FL Techniques as well. Um, my whole um, unit got virtual in just two weeks, right? Uh, due to the COVID restrictions uh, with, uh, without the ability to meet, uh, without the ability to be physical with your uh, students, uh, we got virtual in, in what, in like two weeks, right? And I think that uh, looking ahead, I do not uh, think that this will be a temporary thing because this ability for us to be virtual, uh, to zoom in, zoom out, to, to meet in all other platforms will have a drastic impact to our behavior. Why? Because it will not only be perceived to be easier, but for the airlines, for the MROs, this will be a cheaper option because you will save costs on travels, on, on all, everything, right? And I think that we will see the, the, the same um, things developing in other units, in other service lines as well. And uh, to be honest, when it comes to automation and to artificial intelligence, uh, it depends on wh which part around the world are you in. Because the investment that you will put into the artificial intelligence is rather huge, right? So I, will, I would predict that, for example, as crazy as it might sound, the Western uh, world will invest more into the artificial intelligence and data minings just because that uh, labor force is much more expensive there. And uh, for the rest of the world where the labor um, costs are cheap, it will be a very big dilemma whether to invest your money into artificial intelligence and automation or to stick to the human power, which is relatively cheap, right? And it has, of course, other advantages as, as an old face-to-face -face communication there as well. Oh, yeah, Marius, you have to add to this? Uh, well, I agree with, with Francesco's opinion. So he described everything really, really well. All right, I have another very important... Yeah, continue, please. Can I, can I say something very brief? Uh, and uh, I need to agree that say, and, and very interesting that uh, this uh, effort tennis is doing with the 147. I visit, uh, I, I was so lucky to visit the facility there, and they have a very impressive facility in business. I, I love it very. And, uh, and, and, and uh, I'm supporting completely your idea. I, I'm coming back to that I said that some of the provisional solution uh, will be permanent, probably, probably will be permanent. My, uh, my only concern and uh, all these changes has to be supported by the regulation. All these changes has to be supported. Again, now I'm coming back to the authorities. The authority has to act also on this and allow that this 147 will be able to create the scenarios that myself from Abu Dhabi in UAE will be able to follow a type training in effort techniques in Vilnius in Britain. 
This is Nicholas, something that we can do. Nicholas, small interruption here, but just to support the idea. And I think that this is, again, coming to the idea of unity. We as an industry here also have to unite to uh, maybe it will be a rough position from my side to say to push the regulators, but really to have a close discussion with them on how in this turbulent times we have to really transform. The reason for that is that this is not something that we have seen before and the regulators, which have historically been very conservative, have to adapt to the situation as well. Uh, I'm very happy to see that EASA, the European regulator, in terms of virtual trainings, they moved quite fastly. Uh, EASA, in terms of DOA modifications, with the temporary approvals, with a re really faster approach to the STC approvals, also showed the support to the industry, right? But these are one or two examples that we see within EASA. I'm not sure how about the other regulators, but I think mm -hmm. that we do have to have a radical shift in terms of how uh, our regulators think and how they do support this transition to aviation to be aviation 2.0. Let me, let me give you a small example, but this is not exactly on this, on this subject, but uh, I think we can take uh, also uh, uh, as example of what should happen. Uh, we, I have uh, many debates with the regulators around the world because, I mean, when you are in Middle East, you have to deal with many authorities uh, around the world because you need several approvals. And relating to the manpower for the MROs, I still cannot understand why it's mandatory to have a minimum number of big ones or big two to getting approved in a serious type. This is a commercial activity. You don't have enough numbers to comply with the, uh, with the contract. You cannot do the job. That's it. This you have to do. The argument uh, normally is coming that from the regulator say that you can bend corners that you have not the enough number of power. So it's a doubt on the capability of the operator, of the MARO, to be able to self-control uh, themselves. No? So in this case, I completely agree with you in the aspect of uh, uh, modifying the, the market to adapt to the new situation. And again, I don't think this situation is going to stop in one or two months, even with the uh, the markets are opening again and the aircraft are flying again, waves are going to come. So all these actions that we are taking provisional, we need to take definitely. So we have to be flexible enough to adapt to the new times. I have a, a, one of the questions for Richard Thompson from Africa, a good friend of mine. They say, do you think that we'll result in consolidation on MROs due to the financial situation? It's not only consolidation of the MRO, we discussed before. As uh, Lida said, I think it's a moment for the industry to sit together, to analyze what is happening now, and analyze what is going to happen in a few months. And it's time to change the mindset. And fully agree with you. Uh, you have to be conservative when you, when you are speaking about the safety. For sure, we cannot allow the, the, the changes to compromise the safety and increase the number of suffering. Completely agree. But there are, there are resources, there is technology on the market that can be applied to change, to change the game. All right. Since we, are talk, we spoke about regulations, I have a couple of questions for Marius, which are coming from a few audience. Uh, Richard Thompson is asking whether is there any regulation for the seat types or any additional type of certification is required for these cabin modifications? Uh, and uh, well, for C types, no, definitely no. If if uh, seats are installed on the aircraft, so so aircraft is, ha already has uh, like a relevant engineering order, locus, so we can we can add cargo on any C type. And what's the second question? Uh, any additional type of certification is required for these cabin modifications? Uh, well, so. As, as we are part 21 organizations, so, you know, we have the right to, to approve that kind of modifications uh, as, as minor change, but if modification is, is required to be um, uh, like a major, so, so then we need to approve it via like EASA regulations, right? And then we make it like EASA STC. Uh, so maybe just for the installation kit, that installation kit must be certified like TSO C ninety C must have this certification, so so that just that you could 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 add it on board. 
and uh-huh. it's like shipping sanitizers or you know even huge ventilators on these um, seats is it a challenge or i it's one, the, it's one of the questions like uh, this question is coming from mr malik samdi he works mm-hmm. with transworld aviation in dubai he is asking that based on the size of passenger seat and cargo regulations the items will be limited to masks and gloves so will so shipping of sanitizers uh, well cargo items are limited to the to the height they, they should be like little bit higher than the, the seat back right and also just in in in, in the regulation side so we need to add extra cabin attendant just to 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 serve the cabin during the operations also also we need to check the emergency equipment layout if needed so so we are adjusting that adding additional fire extinguishers so or or what well, what's what's needed there but all these are quite minor things and uh, all, all it, it's always possible you know to 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 go through yeah we again we have an open question like uh, all of us know that airlines don't yeah please continue yeah yeah i i think swati my minor comment here would be that uh, i would highly urge uh, or the airlines who are thinking about the uh, cargo business uh, here not to stick to the local temporary approvals here because i i think that you know uh, all the doa organizations part 21 organizations are as i said developing their own minor uh, um, minor mods or the stcs and you know i i think that this saving on really going with a temporary approval through the cea is something very non sustainable right uh, with such an approach you are really endangering your own safety there and you are you know trying to overcome something that could be a sustainable business opportunity for you in future right so i think that again for the airlines i would invest these money to the modifications there to have a you know sustainable solution for the future as we discussed cargo business most probably in the future will be just going up and then you know you would have this solution implemented not for like you know 10 flights but you will be able to utilize this for the future as well all right uh, another very interesting question i got here is are the government subsidies support and bailout packages help will he, will it help to retain the key employees this is coming from uh, ramesh krishnan from boeing uh, who would like to take this or oh, anything cash you uh... whether the government subsidies support and bailout packages helping to retain the key employees i think that yeah. you know i will start here because this is a very controversial discussion here right and i think that we are going out of the normal airline businesses here this is really we are coming to almost geopolitics where uh, uh, bail outing the airline goes above from saving your employees but really of l- leaving your country competitive itself uh, leaving your country reachable so this is not about the airline industry as such this is much more of how open the whole economy will be and this just shows how important the air industry is right because this is a connectivity that connects the countries that connects the continents and this is why uh we i think that shouldn't think as uh, a bailout to a specific company or a specific industry this is something of all of the interest of us of the citizens of the world that we would have the world connected which will have a huge impact to the whole global economy recovering faster right so i think that you know you might see some macroeconomists and and an analysts you know going against the bailouts i think that this would would have to be more a discussion how much how intensive and in what form but that the air industry have to be supported i think that this is a no brainer for anyone Now, so Nicholas, you want to add to this? No, no, I am. I am fully agree with the view that we are speaking here much more than the, that. The, the benefits of uh, the shareholder or on any specific company. Uh, you you see how many times you sell, you repeat the the word survival. 
This is that we are speaking now, or survival. We are not even speaking of passing to the second level. How can we survive? But we are, when we are speaking of survival of airlines, we are speaking of how the country is able to communicate with others. I mean, uh, uh, look, this is a small example. We have a, a, a lockdown in many countries around the world, uh, and complete lockdown. And it's, uh, yes. Even here in UAE, you know, with all the measures that this government has been very well taken, and then we need to come to a lockdown. One of the industries that has not been suffering the lockdown has been the aviation industry. Even when the airlines are not flying because uh, uh, the security of the country is in there, the MROs and the associate industry, the, uh, the associate companies to the aviation industry and continue working. In fact, do, do I received calls from colleagues uh, on, the, on the, our industry that the level of uh, cases, of coronavirus cases in our industry is much higher that in the average of the country. And it's normal because we are still, we continue working uh, and, not, uh, in, and not from home. So this is a good example to see how important uh, strategically for any country, not for this country or not for our country, is the aviation industry. If you stop, uh, there are many, many industries around the world that uh, are able to damage seriously the global economy. But if you stop the aviation around the world, you are stopping the economy around the world. It's impossible to, to, with, without the movement of personnel. So I am completely agree with you that this is the government has to take actions and has to support. There are many ways, there are many voices uh, that are speaking on this subject, probably much more qualified than myself, but uh, aviation has to continue. There's no other way. What do you think? So going ahead from here, like once the COVID-19 pandemic is over, once things slowly start falling back in place and everything sets back into a normal mood, what do you think? Are there any specific periodic medical checks for, you know, all the aviation personnel, for the cabin crew or the pilots? Or will, will there be the changes in working style anticipated on production lines? Uh, this question is coming from uh, Rajiv Dando now. He works with Air India Engineering Services in Mumbai. So, what do you think? Yeah. I, I can, I can, I can uh, take this uh, initially if you, if you allow me. Uh, again, I'm coming back to something that say maybe half an hour ago. This, the world, not only aviation, the world changed for good. So this, uh, the 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 way that we are working, the way that we are living our life, you know, we the same again, ever. So. There are measures that we are taking provisionally now that really, really, we have to think on how to implement in a permanent way. Uh, I mean, we have, unfortunately, we have this uh, 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 scenario before when the attacks were in uh, New York, that there were some measures that were implemented uh, around the world, uh, only, for, only for something that happened there specifically uh, very sadly, but it's happening in one city. So now we are speaking of something that affecting of the uh, worldwide population. So for sure, there will be measures that not only during the recovery time, I think forever there will be measures that will be implemented uh, on our industry uh, in a permanent way, for sure. Nicholas, just to join the discussion here, I think that, you know, we should not be thinking about only the MRO business. I think that, you know, this permanent change in how we look to the health safety will be in the air travel. It will be on the passengers. We will be, you know, as we were screened for the metal detectors here, I think that the future lies in how we will be screened for the temperature, how we will be screened for the coughing, how we will be screened and that sanitizers will be, uh, you know, a new norm, a new hygiene and all the new type of screening for not only the metal devices, but also for the healthy related checks will be there in the MROs, will be there in the airports, will be there as a natural part of the next industry, you know, infrastructure that we will have. And, and it's very interesting, taking back some words from Marius before, how in the future some solution will come in the cabin arrangement uh, for the future. It will be very interesting to see how the OEMs are coming with some arrangement in the cabin for the future to, 
to uh, I'm sure. permanent life. I'm sure, and this is again the opportunity. If we look from the perspective of the opportunity for the design organizations, I think that this is where we, as the Part 21 organizations, should be thinking and should be investing our energy to, because um, health and safety will be the aspects which will drive the modification business for the future. Absolutely. I am thinking the 145 organization training human factors, the DT docent will be changes very soon. And sure. No, Nicholas, this, this is not that it will be changing. It's already changing. It's happening now, right? It's <laughs> that you have a little bit of the time lag there when they will be implemented on paper. Next time. All right, we are almost coming to our end of the discussion. I know and continue us. This is the second webinar. Of, I'm very happy to tell you that we had about 100 participants uh, coming in this webinar. So I would uh, like to go towards the closure and let's start with the closing comments. How do you see that the Maros and Airlines will recover from this crisis? And any words of caution or advice from each of you to the aerospace industry as a whole? Let's start with uh, Luidas. Yeah, you can start. I think that, you know, I, I will stick to my original idea. My kind advice uh, here would be to come out stronger by being united, by looking for better, stronger partnerships, by looking at uh, how we can connect. Because this is not the time now to, uh, you know, to fight. This is a moment where building the synergies and building the connections will make us all stronger. So the more connected we are, the stronger we'll be. So my call to the whole uh, aviation uh, family would be, let us stick together and let us innovate. Let us uh, turn the aviation to aviation 2.0, as I said. Yeah, Nicolas, please. I love this aviation 2.0. I will, I will write down this idea also. Uh, now, uh, I fully agree with Lidas. Uh, we are, uh, again, I'm taking, I'm taking back the, the word from Dave Carlton. Uh, we are in uncharted waters now. Uh, time to, uh, to uh, be flexible. Time, it's not time anymore for a single cowboy riding the, the horse. So it's, it's time to work together for this. Uh, again, I'm very proud of how the people in, in the organization, the Denmark organization, also the line for sure, around the world has been doing this huge effort to cope with the difficult times, with the difficult situation. Uh, and for sure, I want to, from here, I want to wish all the best for these people that is having a bad moment, that is uh, suffering uh, because this uh, situation around the world and wish everybody to be safe and happy. Thank you so much, uh, Shirwati, for the invitation. I'm looking forward to seeing you soon. Uh, Marius, what is your advice? What would you say? Yeah, I actually definitely agree with Ludas and um, uh, Nikolai, but, you know, I think that uh, at the industry level, companies and uh, aviation companies, especially airlines, uh, must closely work with the government because, yeah, so, so they, they should closely work to the government. So this is the, 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 the main, the, the time when government can support and then show loyalty to, to the airlines who are bringing, like, a lot of tourists, a lot of people to the countries and, and, and keeping a lot of um, high paid, uh, high paid uh, staff inside the country. All right. So a few takeaways from this discussion is like we need government support. The government needs to closely work with their lines. We are in uncharted waters. That's very true. And for that, we need to stay united. We need to stay connected. And let's look out for Aviation 2.0 in coming days, as Lira said. Thank you all Thank you. for joining this discussion. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you very much, Thank guys. You so much. Bye.